to the Courthouse Cultural Center and our newest exhibition, Works in Living Color by artist Dorothy Gillespie. Thank you for joining us tonight for Inspired by Dorothy, a conversation about her life and artwork, presented by her son, Gary Israel. Dorothy Gillespie was an American painter and sculptor who was born in Roanoke, Virginia in 1920. She forged an artistic career that was independent, innovative, an individual that spanned for over 70 years. She studied art at Maryland Institute College um, of Art, Baltimore, Maryland, then moved to New York City, where she studied at the Art Students League of New York, and then uh, Stanley William Hector LEA, 17. Always experimenting and trying new materials, Elizabeth was a master of many mediums, including painting, paper, sculptor, printmaking, environments, and happenings, ceramics, jewelry, and set design. Her work incorporated many significant 20th century trends in art, including abstract expressionism, decorative abstraction, site-specific installations, and art in public places. She pioneered joyful new aluminum strips that radiate, undulate, or curl like giant arrangements of ribbon. Enchanted towers are bursting fireworks. Early in her career, Gillespie contributed to the women's art movement and helped blaze a path for women artists during the feminist art movement in the 1960s and 70s. Ms. Gillespie's works have graced and still grace many institutions, museums, colleges, universities, public places, and private collections, nationally and internationally. She was one of the first artists to offer her art to the world through displays in lobbies of public institutions and governmental centers, such as the Mayo Clinic, Epcot Center, Fort Lauderdale Airport Delta Terminal, Fort Lauderdale Museum of Art, just to name a few. And we are fortunate to have her works on display until April 15th. Education was always very important to Dorothy, and during her life, she visited over 50 colleges and universities where she would give public lectures, coach and talk young artists. Among her many honors, she was a distinguished professor of art, Radford University, and Woodrow Wilson Teaching Fellow for many years. In 1990, she was recognized for her commitment to education when she received a doctor of pedagogy, pedagogy at Niagara University. Most recently, she was selected as the historical honoree at the 19th Annual NIAC Center Honors Women of Leadership and Vision. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Gary Israel and Dorian. Oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> And I think we can go right to the Q and A. Yeah. <laughs> How do I follow that? Well, there was wow. a lot to okay, hear. so you're going to hear. Mm, you're going to hear similar. Maybe <laughs> let's just throw out slides one through. Yeah, right. um, well, good evening. I want to thank Martin Arts for inviting me to speak this evening about my mother, an amazing woman. It is good to be back in Stewart after attending last month's opening reception of this extraordinary exhibition titled Dorothy Gillespie Works in Living Color, which spans eight decades of our mother. If my sister had not flown from Thailand, it would have been my mother. So if I make mistakes, she'll correct me. Her prolific career over 50 uh, sculptures and paintings as you can see, my mother was more than a mother. She was a painter, a sculptor, environmental artist, installation artist, feminist, activist, mentor, writer, educator, lecturer, filmmaker, and philanthropist. My mother, our mother, sorry, our mother passed away in 2012 at the age of 92. She left quite the legacy two art studios, 
born in Manhattan that she had from 1972 until her death, and one in the Catskills, New York, she had built 25 years ago, which I still work in today, which I open to the public every summer. Next week, I'm flying up to New York to spend two days in the studio working on another exhibition that I'm having next month at the New York Hall of Science in Queens, New York. Upon my mother's, our mother's death, all of her drawings, paintings, portraits, sculptures, went into the Dorothy M. Gillespie Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit. Later, I will tell you more about the work of the foundation. In her New York City studio, I discovered rows of file cabinets full of catalogs, flyers, brochures, journals, letters, press releases, artist statements, newspaper and magazine articles, slides, cassettes, 8mm film, and VHS tapes. I donated 24 boxes to Rutgers University Libraries, where they've begun to digitize them. I'm very excited that our mother's papers are now part of the Miriam Shapiro Archives on Women Artists, which is one of the largest archival collections dedicated to collecting and preserving women artists' papers, publications, and organizations in the United States. For the past 10 years, I've traveled to more than 115 cities, meeting with museum directors, curators, university administrators, city officials, and collectors, learning more about our mother, her art, and sharing our plans for preserving her art and her legacy. I would like to share with you what I've learned about this extraordinary woman. At age five, my mother knew she wanted to be an artist. She always said that was interesting, strange, because she never met an artist. In the 1920s and 1930s in Roanoke, Virginia, where my mother lived, there were no galleries or museums and no opportunities to study art. The first female artist to inspire my mother was the French painter, painter Rosa Bonheur, who lived in the 1800s. My mother saw a photograph of Bonheur's The Horse Fair, 1853, in an encyclopedia. Although the re reproduction was small, the caption gave the dimensions of 96 inches by 199 inches. So she knew it was large, and she knew that she also wanted to make big art. At age 11, she won the first Rano, Virginia citywide art competition for children. She was encouraged to enter the competition by a high school art teacher who was a graduate of the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, where my mother would attend art school seven years later. This slide I discovered recently from my mother's high school yearbook. This spring, an attractive, talented, good-natured girl would bid adieu to Jefferson. She has a swell, top-notch personality. <laughs> These characteristics we see and shall continue to see in Dottie as she draws her way to success. My grandparents and my sister's grandparents <laughs> and okay. my son's great-grandparents <laughs> were not pleased that our mother wanted to go to art school and, became, and become an artist. In the 1930s and 1940s, girls were nurses or teachers. She entered the Maryland Institute College of Art in 1938, which was founded in 1826 and is one of the oldest art schools in the United States. In 1983, she received the school's first Distinguished Alumni Award. Here she is pictured with Jeff Koons in the school's magazine of notable alumni. Jeff Koon is known for the Balloon Dog, a mirror-polished stainless steel sculpture which sold for $59 million. Wow. Yeah. What do you think? What do you How think? much? <laughs> That's what I'm ahead. <laughs> um, here are some of, of my mother's, our mother's early drawings from art school, which I still have in the studio. And when I open up to the public, uh, it's fascinating. People go through the drawers and they see these and they go, wait. How did she do this? But all artists start, start off this way. Yes, this slide um, I found after uh, our mother passed away in her Hollywood apartment. It's uh, 1939, it's a project that, that she did, and it's actually 
in this exhibition. The first time it's been shown, by the way, uh, was in this exhibition. I thought it was important to be part of it. So that covers many decades of this exhibition. After graduating from art school, my mother moved to Greenwich Village in New York City, 1943, and met our father her first day looking for an apartment. He owned the bar on the ground floor, and she found an apartment on the fifth, fifth floor, and the rest is history. <laughs> During the day, she worked at the B. Altman department store doing display windows and advertising and painted at night. She also continued her art education, as we said before. At the Art Students League, she studied with Sidney Edward Dickinson, who taught life drawing, painting, and composition. His direct and candid teaching method suited my mother. She also took sculpture classes at the Clay Club and studied etching at Stanley William Hayner's printmaking studio, Atelier 17. With his philosophy and ethos of never quite completing, always experimenting in the matter of making art, Atelier 17 was a formative influence. This is a self-portrait of our mother that she did in 1943 when she moved to Greenwich Village. I have this and many other portraits and self-portraits in her studio. I'm always asked, why didn't your mother smile in any of her self-portraits? Well, she was a student of history, and throughout art history, happy self-portraits are a rare sight. My mother didn't paint self-portraits to pr practice conveying emotions. It was rather to experiment with colors, techniques, and styles of painting. This is a 1944 painting titled Dancers, and it's from my mother's pre-abstract period. She was 24. You can see the dancers. Later on, my mother would paint totally abstract. This painting is part of a 29-piece Dorothy Gillespie National Traveling Retrospective from Radford University Collection that travels all around the country. Last year, it was on display for six months at the Castellani Art Museum in Niagara, New York. This May, the retrospective will be in an exhibition in Wilmington, North Carolina. This is an early self-portrait dated 1946, the year that our mother married our father. If you look closely, you can see it's signed uh, Gillespie slash Israel. Just being married, she was excited to put her husband's name on her painting. That would be the last painting we ever discovered with our father's name, because that was the year our mother became a feminist. She always said, why should I give credit to your father for a painting he didn't do? And that was her advice to all young artists, use your maiden name. Uh, by the way, she was 26. He was 36 when they got married. He was recently divorced with two children, and they got married with the condition of no children, and we can testify that, that didn't work out too well. One year later, my sister was born, and in 1949, I was born. The fact that my mother, our mother, had two children in the 1940s, when she was in her 20s, was very unusual for women artists at the time. Uh, the year our parents got married, they opened a nightclub in Greenwich Village called Salle de Champagne. It was a famous nightclub, sort of the Sardis of Greenwich Village, where celebrities frequented, like Cary Grant, Shelley Winters, Ed Sullivan, Marlon Brando, Lucille Ball, Montgomery Cliff, Leonard Bernstein, Henny Youngman, Zero Mistel, Jerome Robbins, Tony Bennett, Harry Balafonte, Judy Holliday, and many more would drink champagne and listen to nightclub employees perform. I found this business card uh, in my mother's archives. No area code. Curious. When, when did area codes start? Does anyone know? What year? What did what? When area codes? When, when did you need to put an area code in telephone? Oh, yeah, yeah. what was that? I don't know. I was waiting to hear. Area codes. I don't know. Nineteen fifty-one. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Here are my parents, our parents. Oh, thank you. Dorian, you got you can't yeah. come with me. Yeah. Um, hold on to this a little longer. So yeah, these these were taken of our parents uh, in the nightclub. Again, he was ten years old, or she was our grandparents really 
love that. But they became, they loved him later on. So, you uh, on this slide, you can see our mother's paintings on the wall. Look at how everyone is dressed. And I'll just go off script a little. Andrew's going to kill me for this. Um, when our father met our mother, he had said to me, he said, I never saw anyone dress the way your mother dressed when she came into the bar because women dress like that. And she was dressed in jeans and sandals and a shirt. And I think that's what excited him to see that because his first wife, he would tell us, always was so proper and dressed proper. And your mother, sandals, she didn't care how she dressed. He was really a, a bohemian beatnik back then. In this one, you can see that uh, she, the walls of the nightclub have her self-portrait and our father's portrait, and I have both of them in the studio, and so that's part of the tour. My parents were very liberal and hired black and gay staff for the nightclub. The New York City police did not look favorably to that, and in 1951, shut down the nightclub and we moved to South America for three years. In our mother's paper, she wrote, quote, moving has never been a problem for me. I respect the past, love the moment, and look forward to the future. I mean this in a physical sense, too. So moving to Peru with a husband and two young children was just a nice adventure. 1954, after three years in Peru, we moved to Miami, where my parents opened another nightclub called The Gallery. My mother not only displayed her artwork, but artwork of other women artists. She was always supporting other women artists. Our father playing clarinet. <laughs> Andrew, just go back. I don't know if you, it's great having my sister oh here my because God. I started ad oh my God. But this, the stage, do you remember it turned she around? Turned and as around. a child, it was just so much fun to, to see our parents get dressed and up at night. She built that stage. She yeah. built it mechanically and did all the interior for that whole um, restaurant, which yeah. was like a warehouse. She, she, the cloud, she put clouds to make it look Clouds to make the yeah. ceiling look, oh my God. Okay, this is going to bring back memories. You remember that table? She made it I'm, I'm with marble. Yeah. Um, here is our mother in our Miami house home, surrounded by her abstract art. You can see it's abstract. There's nothing. Uh, even if that was a picture of Picasso's artwork, he wasn't an abstract painter. You would see things in it. Here, you see nothing, and that's what she loved about abstract. In fact, <laughs> uh, here she is painting in her studio. She loved painting abstract because, quote, every brush stroke was new and had never been done before. I love this quote. Quote, I think I had tremendous joy. Sometimes I have ecstasy while I'm working. I feel very fortunate to have that. That means I'm totally in touch with the glorious things when I'm painting. The left oh, photo. I want to say something. She also told me that when she was in that state of ecstasy, that she understood that suicide, you could just throw yourself out the window because you're so in the moment and so extraordinarily happy. And so I was always like, okay, mom, thanks for that. Yeah. I'm worried about what right, thanks for that. In this uh, slide, there's a photo of a cathedral on the left. That would be the last recognizable image that our mother painted. She decided she didn't want to dictate to the viewer what they see. She wanted them to see what they wanted to see. And many times she didn't title her works for that reason. These are some of the abstract works. You'll probably recognize some of these. Uh, and I have most of these in the studio. These slides show her large abstract paintings. My mother always felt she had to paint large 
to be considered equal to a man. That would certainly influence her large metal works in the 1970s and for the rest of her career. The art editor for the Miami Herald wrote in 1962, Miss Gillespie has in her collection two of the largest easel paintings we have ever seen. These works, measuring 12 feet in height and 16 and a half feet in width, each covers an entire wall of the largest exhibition room in the museum. Miss Gillespie's works are pure abstractions, communicating whatever they communicate, and Miss Gillespie is adept in both fields. She uses color superbly, and her blocky, square shapes are attractively assembled. This is an invitation to her 1962 opening exhibition at the Miami Museum of Art. Shortly after our mother passed away, I located this painting in the collector's home in Naples, Florida. I walked in and I just, I, I personally loved her early works, her paintings. I love this because it brings joy to people, but to me, when I walked in there, maybe it's the memories of, of that period, that's the 50s. Uh, I located these paintings in the Virginia Museum of Art in their permanent collection. I recently located these paintings in the Fort Lauderdale Museum of Art's permanent collection. This one I located, 19, uh, this 1962 painting, in a museum in Kassel, Germany. They actually contacted me. I had no idea. So I'm always, over the 10 years, I'm always learning more about her art, where it's located. So the story's not finished. Aww. Oh, boy. Oh. It's so nice to have my sister here, <laughs> because I'm usually saying, well, that's my sister up there, oh, but that's... Okay, and this was an article in the 1959 Miami News titled, Meet a Gal Who Lives Three Lives. I remember when the photographer me came too, in. Me too. Really? I thought oh, it was totally. Um, new, uh, and the, the newspaper reporter came to our house to do the story. Of course, I'm on the right, the middle child who never gets in. And by the way, she's had another baby. Uh, yes. You forgot to mention. Well, he's not here. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah, my mother did it all. Uh, she was wife, mother, artist, and of course, hostess at a nightclub. Uh, later on, when we moved to New York City, 1963, she would become a filmmaker, host her own radio show, which was really cool, and of course, become a metal sculptor. Ah, what does this mean? It means it's a dangerous thing when your personality stands out from your work. Well, it meant that it was time for her to move now three children and her husband back to Manhattan to be able to create our art anonymously. And I never understood why we moved back, but after she passed away in her archives, I found this newspaper article and the reporter said, why would you move your three children, your family up to New York? And she said she was in a grocery store online and a woman came over and this was the show at Miami Museum of Art and remarked about the show. And my mother beamed and said, oh, well, what do you think of my art? And the woman says, oh, I don't know anything about abstract art. And my mother realized that her personality uh, thing or whatever was getting in front of her art where she was being distracted and that it would be time to go back to New York City to be able to walk the streets and not be known for uh, as a celebrity or whatever as an artist. So we moved back to New York City and they opened up another nightclub called the Champagne Gallery and our mother got involved in the Happening Movement and this was a very important time. Uh, the Happenings upended the conventions of what art could be going beyond sculpture and painting to introduce a blending of different mediums. In 1964 our mother did a Happening titled The American Way of Death. It was described as a realistic environment of a funeral park with coffins, burial lot plans, burial accessories, faithfully reproduced with tainted plans, prices, and attractive sale descriptions. The following year, our mother's happening was made in the USA, which dealt with American consumerism. Art critic Marshall Matsu wrote, quote, Dorothy Gillespie, a New York City housewife, mother, 
nightclub operator and a full-time artist came to the fore this week with the opening of her show, Made in the USA. A critical environment, one of the most affirmative statements we've seen this year in the gallery world. The blending of art with the total of society comes out a winner. The juxtaposition of man, woman, money, sex, the state, all blend into a provocative experience that will activate your mind long after you leave the gallery. This is not the social realism of 1930s, nor is it the avant-garde of the 1920s. It's just what it says, a critical environment reflecting the 1960s. In 1966, our mother had her flag show. In a New York Times Sunday, do you remember that, Tori? Yeah, it was amazing. Um, Alfred Clark said, quote, a modern Betsy Ross named Dorothy Gillespie figured that she had cut, snipped, shaped, and painted about 3,500 stars in mylar, aluminum, and plastic materials for her one-woman show devoted to representations of the American flag. Our mother expressed her philosophy of art in the flag show. Quote, my basic idea is to involve the viewers in all of their five senses they use, sight by viewing the whole show, sound by listening to the tape of patriotic songs, touch by walking through the flag, smell by the odor of deodorizer, and taste by partaking of red scotch, white gin, and blue rock. <laughs> Our mother's interest in film as an art form was initiated by her experience in the happening and she purchased a camera for the purpose of shooting her films in the future. This is a quote from our mother about her participation in the happenings. If it weren't for her, my participation in the happenings, I probably wouldn't paint the way I do today. After happenings, my paintings started to come off the wall and intrude into the spectator's space. During the 1970s, our mother's mother encouraged more women's art in museums and art places. She became closely associated with the Women's Inner Art Center in New York City. One of her first tasks was the creation of the Women's Artists Historical Archives. She conducted interviews with both well-known and lesser-known women who had made art their life work. According to her mother, it seemed essential to establish a central resource of this kind. Here she is pictured in front of the Women's Inner Art Center. Her art studio was also located, located in the same building. In 1974, our mother organized a new group of New York professional women artists. Members lectured at universities and wrote articles to encourage women artists. That year, our mother organized an innovative outdoor exhibition titled Walkthrough Art, which consisted of 12 walkthrough triangles. Here she is pictured in her walkthrough triangle. Each triangle expressed the individual artist's style. The exhibition was mounted in Central Park, Battery Park, and traveled to 50 colleges, universities, and street fairs around the country. In 2001, our mother received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Women's Caucus for the Arts for her work, vision, and commitment to women in the visual arts. This is a quote from Douglas Covington, President of Radford University. Quote, whether or not they realize it, artists through the ages will owe much to Gillespie. She was among those who transformed the art world, opening doors for women artists. She forged her own styles, expressing a vision of to which people responded visually and viscerally. Public art was always important to our mother. I remember my mother always telling people, quote, I'm a believer in public art, art in public places. People should be able to grow up with art, live with it. It's not just something to go see in a museum. She did this mural in 1975 during the International Women's Year. The wall was the first in New York City to be done in a past, soft pastel colors, and the only one by a woman in 1975. After completing the wall, a man came over and asked me, my mother, who did this mural? She said, she did, and the man was incredulous that a woman could do that. From then on, 
Our mother would sign her works Dorothy Gillespie, not just Gillespie, so everyone would know a woman created them. She would always advise women artists also to use their maiden name. Unfortunately, my mother's mural is no longer there as the building was torn down. I am happy to say that the mural that my mother did in 1979 in Roanoke is still there. And when I was recently in Roanoke, I parked my car there in the lot next to the mural, which was pretty cool. <laughs> One of my goals as president of the Dorothy M. Gillespie Foundation is to place all her works, indoor and outdoor, public works, into the public art archive, which is a worldwide database. Here are 20 of her installations around the country that are in the public archive. The closest installation to Stewart would be the Fort Lauderdale International Airport. The sculpture titled Colors and Forms in Flight has been there since 1989 and has been seen by millions of people. There are 40 aluminum panels. Each measures 25 inch, inches by 28. In my mother's artist statement, she says, quote, public art is a very important aspect of the art world and an airport terminal is about as public as anything can be. The use of aluminum is very exciting because it's also the metal used for airplanes. Mm -hmm. Oh, can I get off the How are we doing on time? Uh, I got bad news. This, this was taken down. I was, told, I was told it was taken down. Good news, it should be installed in a new location more visible than this one. So that is a good news. Okay, uh, paper. The medium of paper, and we have some paper sculptures here. Me medium of paper was very important to our mother's artistic development. Paper allowed her to move her art off the wall and also to work large. She believed that art on paper was compatible with our mobile society. It's easy to pack, easy to unroll, hang on the wall, and enjoy. This 1977 paper exhibition was at the Jersey City's Museum. Art critic Virginia Remberts wrote in an article, quote, Gillespie dramatized the scale of the five flight staircase while employing it as a showcase for a presentation of four linear sculptures that looped and twisted its way up a spiraling shaft with lengths of paper 18 inches by 150 feet foretelling the artist's unusual dimensions for future works. This was her paper works exhibition in New York University. Art historian Francis Martin wrote about our mother. Quote, she is paper and paper is Gillespie. In a 1977 New York Times article, David Sheary wrote, Gillespie uses simple white paper, lots of it, in large sheets that she wraps around cylinders. What Gillespie does with the paper is what endows her works with spunk. Natalie Edgar wrote in the February 1978 issue of Arts Magazine that eventually Dorothy Gillespie saw the drawback of paper, its fragility, and of course paper doesn't work outside. So my mother began working with metal, first steel and then going to aluminum. This is a 43-foot sculpture that she created for Roosevelt Island in 1978. Roosevelt Island is an island in New York City's East River within the borough of Manhattan. It lies between Manhattan Island to the west and the borough of Queens. Our mother would later move away from steel to aluminum, which was easier for her to create her sculptures. Our mother loved to do portraits. Here she is in her New York City studio with her self-portrait. 1979 was the first exhibition of portraits in New York City's Lincoln Center. I'm happy to say that I still have many of her portraits and self-portraits in the Dorothy M. Gillespie Foundation studio in the Catskills. This May, the University of North Carolina in Wilmington will have an exhibition of 18 portraits and self-portraits. This will be the first exhibition of my mother's portraits and self-portraits since she passed away. I'd like to show you photos of my mother, our mother's sculptures around the country in museums, universities, performing arts centers, public buildings, parks, and the homes of her collectors. This photo and the following photo were taken in her New York City studio. She had studios in Orlando, Hollywood, Florida, Miami, Dallas, and in the Catskills. A friend told me, quote, the first time I walked into your mother's studio in Manhattan, I felt like I was inside a music box. 
us. So much color, so much fun. The joy she brings to others with her work is apparent the moment you enter her studio. Art can deal with the tragic and with the joyful. Your mother has chosen the joyful, which is often the more difficult path. And these are various photos taken around the country in collectors' homes, performing artist centers. This uh, was the Rockefeller Center, and if you saw the video, she talks about that. Uh, she always said it was the most exciting thing she ever did. Uh, she said that Rockefeller Center administrators gave her free reign to create what she wanted. She was told she could even affix, attach the metal panels to the sacrosanct walls of the buildings. She was so impressed with the freedom and support they gave her that she said it was almost like working for the Medici's. This was also in the, the video. Uh, it's 96 panels, 10 feet, each one was 10 feet by 4 feet, painted on both sides. It required 10,000 rivets. Uh, one of her nicknames, besides Dorothy uh, the Wizard of Art, was Dorothy the Riveter. She loved to use that rivet gun. The panels were hooked together to form the column and stabilized with 250,000 yards of post-tension cable. Here she is shaping the starburst. She would first paint, someone had asked before, their sheets of aluminum. She would paint them. Then she would cut them and then shape them with her hands. So she had already cut them and now she's shaping them with her hands. Never wearing gloves. She always wanted to feel them. Here she is at age 86, arranging the starburst on the cables that would be hung here. These are 720 starbursts that you can still see in, in Orlando. Uh, she loved to go to universities and coach, mentor, jury shows, have uh, exhibitions. It's a list of the schools that she visited and displayed her work. Most of these schools have her works on display. Uh, I've traveled to over 30 of them. And this is a list of the museums around uh, the world that have her works where she had exhibitions and the, the artwork is in their permanent collection. These are private homes. Last year, the Boca Raton Museum of Art loaned 350 hanging starbursts to the Boca Raton Innovation Campus. Uh, the Boca Raton Museum of Art has the largest Dorothy Art, Gillespie Art Collection of any museum in the country. In 2004, the foundation donated 350 hanging starbursts to the museum. Uh, the museum also loaned these three wall hanging sculptures to the Innovation Campus. The art curator told me that she would be submitting these works to the public art archive so that it would be in the database and people all around the world would be able to know where, where it is. This is a quote from David Shearer, who wrote a few articles about my, our mother. Quote, Dorothy Gillespie is an artist who sees not only the wall, but also all the space around it as a challenge. From 1947 to 2012, our mother had 123 solo shows, 61 group shows, 35 commissions on public display, 
created two sculptural sets for ballets, gave 60 lectures to college campuses across the country, and taught as a visiting artist at 16 universities. I'm proud to say that there have been four PBS documentaries about our mother. For the past three years, I've been work working, my sister has been in Thailand, on a documentary called Dorothy Gillespie, A Life in Living Color, which will premiere this fall. This 2011 photo was taken outside the Florida Museum for Women Artists in Deland, Florida. Our mother was 95 here. Yeah. It would be the last exhibition that she would do before she decided to die the following year. This is a quote from our mother. I attempt to portray imminent movement and energy, manipulating colors and materials so that the eye can carry some mystical message to the soul. The Dorothy M. Gillespie Foundation fosters the legacy of our mother's life and work. The foundation supports artists, initiatives, and institutions that embody the same innovative, inclusive, multidisciplinary approach that Dorothy Gillespie exemplified in both her art and philanthropic endeavors. This is a list of institutions that have received art and education grants from the foundation. The foundation offers art students the opportunity to do internships and art residencies in our mother's studio in the Catskills. Here is a list of institutions that I've donated art to from the foundation. This is art on loan from, uh, from the foundation around the country. And I'd like to end with two quotes. The thing I wanted most in being an artist was to find my center the thumbprint that makes my art mine. I didn't want to jump on any bandwagons that other people were on. I wanted my own signature. I wanted it to come from inside instead of outside of me. Yes? Yes. question with someone when it comes to Q&A, uh, and they raise their hand, and it's like, how much longer? <laughs> so we'll get that up. Uh, I hope not much longer, but Q&A to me is the best. I did a, a presentation once where I started with the Q&A, mm -hmm. because I know what people are, are interested in knowing, so I, I just started the Q&A with questions and started answering myself. Um, but here, you showed a slide that had a public display in Orlando and at the bottom it said it was destroyed. Yes, okay. Uh, we were talking about that before. I love the first one. How many artists have the opportunity to create an entirely new sculpture in the same location? The hurricane in 2003 destroyed it. Okay. Or actually damaged it. She took that opportunity. They wanted her to, to repair it, and she said no, she wanted to create an entirely new one. So she took those 96 panels down and cut them up into the 720. Most artists would say, stay with something that's, it was such a successful piece, it was really a beautiful piece, but she saw that as an opportunity to experiment and try something new. Wow. And so they moved. I think that's what she liked about it. The panel was pretty solid, it didn't move. But the starburst turned, and I think she she always liked movement. So she basically reinvented herself with that. Yeah. What, yes, yes. Uh, the mediums, and that's what uh, is fascinating about when you go to the studio, and I don't know if I told her the story, but my goal uh, is to turn the studio into a museum. Mm -hmm. uh, a museum that is not just about the art lesson, but about an artist, how an artist goes from, I've got 1938, 37, or early works in art school, all the way through those different periods of time. When she could have been in the 1940s, when she was with Lee Krasner and Elaine de Cooney, and that group, they were painting. She was painting too, but she was also thinking down the road. Her works come off the wall. That's why the happening movements when we moved back to New York City in 1963 was so important. And she said that. It, it made her want her works to come off the wall. But the galleries back in the 40s and 50s, they wanted paintings. 
And my mother, our mother, never wanted to play the game with the galleries and all. She was uh, independent, fiercely independent. Just ask our father, Dad. <laughs> she so was very strong. Where did the, where did the collectors that do have her works, where did they get them? Directly from her or great, from the galleries? Great question, because after she passed away, I inherited the studios. Mm -hmm. And I went to her studios to try it because she left no instructions. A lot of artists don't think that they're going to die, or they don't care about their legacy. She couldn't have cared less about her legacy. I don't think she'd be happy what I'm she doing now. Not be happy. Working. I don't think so. Really? I don't. She yeah. wouldn't care. It, it was all about creating the art. So um, I went to start to go through her files in 2012 after she passed away, and started to get names of galleries, museums, universities, collectors. And they would lead me to those 115 cities that I've traveled to. And I go into the collector's home, and, I, and you saw some of the collectors, and I would go, oh, unbelievable, and tell me the story. And they would say, I went to your mother's studio, I invited her to come to my house, our home. She would sit where you're sitting, she would look around, and then she'd go back to the studio and create it. So she loved doing commissions. And so there are so many artists, good collectors out there, and I'm hoping that they'll give me permission one day to do a book on, on the collector's art because a lot of people have never seen them. Right. Mm -hmm. And I love when collectors come to me and offer to donate to the foundation. They get a tax write-off, but then I can go turn around and display the art, mm -hmm. mostly in libraries and performing arts and public places. Right. So that's, that's a big goal. Public art, and I can honestly say, I don't even know if my sister has heard this one yet, that no other female artist in history has her art been seen by more people in the public than Dorothy Gillespie. And people go, oh, well, Georgia Keefe, Louise Memphis, I go, where do you see those artists? In a museum. Now, is that denigrating? Dorothy Gillespie, because that means her work is not worth No, it meant that public art was always so important to her so that people could see it. So that, just that uh, piece that's in the uh, airport, I figured 11 million people because a 1,000 people a day. Well, this new location is going to probably be tens of thousands of people will see it. So that just will add to uh, the eventual total. And as I get more and more art out there on the public archive, and it's all over. It's in Dr. Phillips Center. I don't know if anyone's been to Orlando. It's a $650 million performing arts center. Uh, the one over time shows her art all around. So that's, that's a big goal, public art. That I think she'd be happy about. Yes. But talking about her? No. 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 If she were here, she would talk about the art. Yeah. One of the things I learned uh, is that uh, she never talked about herself with the collectors. So I would go in and they were like, I didn't know she was married, or I didn't know nightclubs. Why would she waste her? She just didn't feel it was important. I, on the other hand, I do feel it's important because it explains why she was able to work 24-7 and spend as much time out of the studio her studios as she did in her studios. A lot of artists lock themselves in their studio and spend. She was out there, nightclub, she was out there traveling around the country. He did. Oh, Halloween home costume. <laughs> she never let us interfere in her creative process. We were always welcome in the studio, but we were not, the, we knew when we were growing up, right? We were not her central focus. Like, I'm not taking you to rehab. You have a problem, it's going to be finished. I don't care. But she was always absolutely there for making our breakfast, putting us on the bus, picking us up, going to our dance recitals. Never, never any problem. Our, our, I don't know how she did it. Well, our, she's an alien. Our brother was younger, much younger. So, so many pieces. How did she do that? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. She must have been fast. Uh, uh, 
she would get up, her schedule was 4 o'clock in the morning, and pain. And she was, is ruthless. You might not have liked her. And if you're an artist, you definitely might not have liked her. Because I saw her in her studio with artists, young artists. Now, she could see dedication, and that's what she appreciated, right? Dedication. I don't know about skill and art and all that, but I will tell you that I have watched her annihilate artists. You thought, well, you know, I just think, and she will say, here's what an artist is. You eat, you sleep, and you breathe it. You might take a detour, but in that time, this is, you don't have a choice. It's like, it's like channeling. You channel it. There's no way around it. If you had a choice, if she had a choice, I think she would have chosen to do something else. I don't know. She did everything else. She did everything. She has no regrets. I asked her uh, just before she died, I said, Mom, do you have any regrets? And I knew she didn't because she was, her whole life she says, oh, I had a wonderful life. And I said, oh, Mom, everyone has a regret. Aren't you sorry you didn't have more than three children? <laughs> I asked her that. And she laughed. I said, you know, I'm kidding. I said, do you regret having children? And she got upset. Why would you say that? And I said, because back in the 40s, 50s, women artists were not having children. They didn't want it to interfere. And Dad made you promise, and he did, because he had two children with previous marriage. And she said, I convinced your dad I, did, I said, how did you convince Dad to have children? If, you, if he already had two children, and you promised. That was the proposal. He promised. Oh, yeah, it was easy. Once we got married, I went to your dad, and I said, Bunny, because he was a musician. That was his nickname, Bunny. I said, Bunny, if we have a child, and my father said, you promised no children. You wanted to travel. You have your art career. But if I do have a children, if we do have a children, child, I promise you that child will never interfere in our lives. And she had three children. We never interfered in our life, in her life. And and so I, I couldn't find a regret. Then I said, okay, I, I have a plan. Do you ever regret marrying dad? And a non-visual artist, I mean, who's a musician, she looked at me, she says, Lee Krasner, Elaine de Cooney, I knew them all. I didn't I wanted to be known for me, not for my husband. And besides, your father took you to the beach, to the yeah. pool, to the playground, so that I could create my art. I was that. Well, yeah, because he worked at night, so he was home with us. Home. So, yeah, she had a perfect life, and she doesn't need this, what her legacy, it was about creating the art. Any questions? <clears throat> I have one more question. At what point in her career did she start working with galleries? Did she even seek them out or did they seek her? Okay. When she passed away, I went through the files and I found all a list of all the galleries, which I thought was interesting because she had always said she didn't want to work with galleries. In the 40s, when Lee de Cooney and uh, Lee Krasner and the other, Joan Mitchell, they always had to be represented by galleries. She said, I'm not going to represent my gallery because I don't want them to tell me what to paint, what people want. So, but meanwhile, I found this list, extraordinary list of galleries. So she did have galleries uh, all around the country. And in fact, I had one gallery that contacted me and was honest enough and said, oh, I have lots of your mother's work. Do you want to pick it up? <laughs> I had no idea, you know. Uh, so there was a lot of art that was on consignment. So she did use galleries, but it was always, she liked to work with collectors directly. Well, I want to say thank you, Gary, and Dorothy, and Andrew, for giving us a glimpse of into Dorothy Gillespie's life and long artistic career. It's a pleasure to view many of her works and collections and take part in the energy of life she created for everyone to admire and enjoy. Due to the generosity of Gary and the Foundation, 
you had a chance to win an original piece of artwork by Dorothy. The piece is on display by some of Dorothy's earlier works in the next gallery. See Jennifer for details and to purchase your tickets. Thank you to the donors for the exhibition and the amazing team of volunteers who yeah. expertly funded the show. <laughs> And every other show we present. If you'd like to know more about volunteering or supporting a future exhibit, let us know. Our next exhibit, opening April 25th, will be the um, Marvin S. Cone 37th Annual High School Jury Show, and will feature the artistic talents of local Martin County area high school students. The teachers are at each school select their pieces for the exhibit. Cash awards are given in multiple mediums and the school principal, superintendent, and area organizations purchase pieces to be a part of permanent collection at their respective sites. Established in 1987, the Howe honors, I said that wrong, mm -hmm. the honors its founder and um, his unrelenting enthusiasm for young people, for the arts, and for his timeless efforts in making this event what it is today. Thank you again for everyone coming for joining us for this inspiring talk. Just a reminder that this exhibit will be on display until April 15th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.